Hello friends, I'd like to present my seven pointers to make a smooth transition to performing phaco emulsification under topical anesthesia. Many surgeons that included me about 10 years ago consider that the ability to perform topical phaco emulsification is yet another milestone to be achieved in their phaco career. So what exactly are the advantages of topical phaco? Now to the patient, it promises a quicker visual recovery and rehabilitation, better post-operative cosmosis, you don't have ptosis, periorbital ecchymosis, where a patient can avoid the pain of anesthesia or peribulbar block and the consecutive day surgery visit is not necessary. To the surgeon, he gets to operate upon an eye that is normally pressurized because hypotony due to overmassage or a tight lobe due to retrobulbar hemorrhage can be troublesome. There's coaxiality of the eye, there's always a peer pressure to stay in the race and also sometimes patients may actually request you to operate them under topical anesthesia. However, topical anesthesia is not for every case and it's not for everyone. The surgeon should be prepared to make that jump by getting consistent surgical outcomes and he should have confidence in their surgical skills. Now the patient selection you should avoid over anxious patients. Definitely avoid those patients who opt for topical because they are scared to get the block. Now there is an easy way by which you can make out if a patient will tolerate topical anesthesia or not. So what I do is I look at the response and the reaction of the patient while performing the applanation tonometry and a 90 d examination. Now this will tell me whether the patient will cooperate during the topical anesthesia procedure. Now with respect to counseling, do not tell the patient there will be no pain. In fact, tell them that the eye will feel numb. However, the touch sensations can be appreciated. The patient sometimes can experience a sense of pressure due to ciliary body stretch that may be similar to pressing the eye with a finger. Now this can occur during certain stages of the procedure and this has to be informed. Inform the patient that they should look straight into the microscope light. Proparacaine will numb the corneal nerves and therefore the patient will not experience photophobia. Now a patient who knows exactly what to expect will either be cooperative or he may opt out of topical anesthesia and opt for a peribulbar block. Now don't ever call yourself a 100% topical phaco surgeon and don't be pressurized to perform topical phaco in all patients who ask for it or demand it. You have to take it on a case by case basis. Now there are certain cases in which you will not perform topical phaco. These include small pupils, IFIS, where pupil dilating devices may be required, comorbid conditions like corneal opacities, post uveitic eyes, subluxated lenses where CTR and other devices need to be implanted, repeat surgeries. And if you simply not feeling up to it because you have a long surgical list ahead of you. Now let's take a look at some of the special precautions we need to take during the surgical procedure itself. Now here are some of the very important pointers which I'd like to present to you. Well, pointer number one is that you need to get a good eyeball fixation, which should be gentle yet firm. Remember, patient can move their eyes as well as squeeze their eyes. While topical anesthesia numbs pain, patient will feel temperature as well as pressure. You can use either a cotton bud fixation or you can fixate via side port instruments or you can use a corneal pocket incision which was pioneered by me. If you use tooth forceps or tauntin fixation ring then make sure that the hold is pretty superficial and you do not press deeply onto the eye. The cotton bud can be used when the eyeball surface is dry. So you use a counter traction to initiate the incision and then shift the position to adjacent the incision. This is also an ideal way to get fixation when you are performing the incisions under topical anesthesia. However, if the patient has a prominent Bell's phenomenon and he tends to squeeze the eye, then the cotton bud will not be sufficient to hold the eye. While some surgeons take fixation through the side port incision itself, now you can use an instrument through the side port. I'm using a closed McPherson's forceps. Now this side port instrument should 
completely seal the side port to prevent the leaking out of viscoelastic which will create hypotony. Now tooth forceps can also be definitely used. You have to have a very gentle pressure on the eye. Do not give a posterior pressure because the patient will be able to appreciate it. Also make sure that the keratome is brand new. Now this is the corneal pocket incision which I use whenever I perform topical phaco. So two blind pockets are made in the cornea at 5 and 7 o'clock position and using this to create a counter traction I create my side port and my main clear corneal incision. Well, the advantage of the corneal pocket incision is that it helps you to take control of the eye even if the patient squeezes the eye. So it gives you a tangential hold. It is along the same plane as the other instruments and it's easy to adapt to. Also, while performing the capsulorexis itself, there is no leak out or ooze of viscoelastic. The chamber is well pressurized. The second important point is do not put drops of BSS on the cornea to moisten it. Patient feels the drops and this will elicit a squeezing sensation. What you need to do is to gently apply viscoelastic over the surface of the cornea to moisten it. Point number three is do not overfill the anterior chamber. There are only two exceptions to this rule. Exception number one is when you are performing the capsulorexis where you need a well formed anterior chamber to flatten the anterior capsule so you can go ahead and easily perform the capsulorexis. The second exception to this rule is while implanting the intraocular lens. So you can see that getting a good eyeball fixation is pretty important in order to perform the capsulorexis. Point number four is hydro dissection is crucial. It should be complete and it should be well done. Because trying to rotate the nucleus with improper hydro will actually induce pain due to the tug of zonules onto the ciliary body. So make sure that the cortical cleavage hydro dissection is complete and always ensure that the nucleus rotates well before embarking on performing FACO under topical anesthesia. Moisten the cornea with viscoelastic. Always underfill the anterior chamber because if the chamber is filled up with visco, especially if it is a cohesive viscoelastic or something like viscoat, the sudden entry of the phaco probe within the eye will cause a sudden distension of the anterior chamber due to ciliary stretch. So always enter with low bottle height. This is point number five. 80 centimeters while you enter and once you enter and the intraocular pressure is equilibrated, then you can reset the height of the bottle. So when you enter the anterior chamber, there should not be a sudden deepening of the anterior chamber. This is important in order to impart a certain degree of comfort to the patient. Now the technique of nucleus disassembly is up to you. You can do the divide and conquer technique or the stop and chop, the horizontal chop or the direct chop. It really does not matter. Pooling of the BSS is being aspirated with a cannula, as you can see. In this particular case, I am using the direct chop technique. It is a grade 2 nucleosclerotic cataract. Remember that once both the instruments are inside the eye, then the mobility of eye is totally under your control. It's only during the initial stages, like creating the incision as well as the capsular excess and hydro dissection that eyeball fixation is very important while performing topical FACO. Intracameral lidocaine is optional. However, I do not use it routinely. 
This is because the paracaine will pass transcornially and transclearly to anesthetize the iris. You should avoid engaging or touching the iris. Now point number six, perform viscofluid exchange before coming out of the eye to prevent sudden shallowing of the anterior chamber because this will also cause the patient to experience a certain amount of discomfort. Now injecting visco with the left hand can be tricky so first practice it in patients who are blocked before you try it on your patients who are being operated under topical anesthesia. The patient is going to move around a bit. You have to be ready for this and anticipate it. Always remember that you keep talking to the patient while they're being operated under topical anesthesia. My professor used to call this as vocal anesthesia. So this will help the patient to calm down as well as maintain fixation on the light. The low bottle height parameters should be maintained even for entry of the coaxial IA probe into the eye. Now in this case, I did not do a viscofluid exchange, but I request that you perform viscofluid exchange every time you remove either the FACO probe or the IA cannula from the eye. Like I said, there are two situations in which the viscoelastic should completely fill the anterior chamber. One is during the CCC and the other during intraocular lens implantation. Point number seven. Patients can experience pain during IOL injection. This occurs due to the stretch of the incision and the corneal nerves. Hence, slightly enlarge the inner lip of the incision before injecting the IOL and this would make the patient much more comfortable when you are operating them under topical anesthesia. In this case, I am slightly enlarging the inner corneal lip and you see that the injection of the intraocular lens goes on smoothly. This lens got delivered slightly prematurely. However, complete in the bag delivery of an intraocular lens would be ideally suited when you are operating a patient under topical anesthesia so as to not touch the iris surface unnecessarily. And finally, a gentle yet thorough visco wash is done at the end of the procedure. Remember that while you enter with the coaxial IA probe, you have to enter with a low bottle height and once you're in, the bottle height should be increased to your preset levels of 90 to 100 centimeters. And finally, make sure of the adequate water tightness of the clear corneal incision and the side port incisions before you close up for the day because this patient is not going to have a protective patch when he walks out of the hospital. And finally, end the case with intracameral moxifloxacin. I hope this presentation has been of help and I wish you good luck in performing your next case of phacoemulsification under topical anesthesia.